العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد وآل الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الإمام صاحب العصر والزمان صلوات الله وسلامه عليه اللهم صل على محمد وعلى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما عرفتنا من الحق فحملنا وما قصرنا عنه فبلغنا The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib The third with your loudest voices in honor of Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad ala Muhammad. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The discussion concerning an Islamic utopia is a fundamental discussion in Islamic thought. An essential discussion when examining the government of Imam Al Mahdi, Ajal Allah Farajah Al Sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. A utopia refers to the ideal perfect state and was a term first used by Sir Thomas More when he was describing a fictional island on the Atlantic Ocean. Many believe that Sir Thomas More had taken this notion from Plato's Republic and the way Plato envisaged the ideal state, as in there is a difference between a utopia and a dystopia. A dystopia is the idea of a totalitarian or repressive world, whereas a utopia is the idea of a perfect state where people live in a peaceful coexistence with one another. That when Plato wrote the Republic, his idea of a utopia or his idea of a perfect state was a state where there would be no more poverty and there would be no more misery. A state which was a state of equality and justice. A state where the people were tolerant of each other's religions. And a state which was generally a pacifist state. There were very few laws and there would be very few lawyers. And the main aspect of that perfect state would be a state where justice would be the norm. And that the people within that state may have different beliefs, but would be able to agree to disagree while living tolerantly within that state. You find that on this basis, every one of the world religions today believes that one day there will be a state which will be a state of justice, where tyranny will be completely removed. If you look, for example, within Hindu thought, or within Zoroastrian thought, or within Jewish thought, or within Christian thought, or within Islamic thought, each one of these religions postulates a theory that there will one day be an ideal state, a state where there will be no poverty, a state where there will be no misery, and a state where a messianic figure will bring success for God's chosen people. For example, if we were to look within Judaism, someone like Herzl would postulate a theory of a Zionist utopia. A utopia meaning a perfect state where Zionism is the main ideology. If you look within Christianity, a utopia would be a perfect state where Jesus, son of Mary, establishes peace on the earth. And if you look within the religion of Islam, 
The idea is given within each and every school of the religion of Islam that the Mahdi will be the one who establishes the perfect state. Some of course reply back by objecting to this idea. Why? Because if you were to ask yourself the question sincerely, do you sincerely believe that when the 12th Imam establishes his government, we will live in a world where there is absolutely no injustice and that everybody loves each other and everybody will be tolerant of each other and that there will be no injustice inside ourselves or outside towards other human beings? When you ask that yourself that question, do you sincerely believe it's a reality or no? As in there are some who will turn around and say that look, I believe in my Imam and I believe he'll have a great role. But if you're telling me that there will one day be a society where each and every human being will pass by and say assalamu alaikum to each other without harboring any malice or harboring any envy and with there being no hypocrisy, then I'm sorry, I don't necessarily agree with such a theory. And the reason some people don't agree is because of two reasons. And both these reasons are valid but have to be examined because tonight's analysis of the Mahdi utopia, myth or reality, is an analysis where I don't want to sit here to tell you what to think. I want to sit here to tell you how to think. Then you yourself go out and develop that thinking. Why do I say this? Mandela used to say that the only way we can change apartheid and develop the cause is not by telling people what to think, but by telling people how to think. When you allow a human being to know the tools to think, then that human being becomes a thinker, not a parrot or a sheep. You see, there is a thinker and a parrot and a sheep. The parrot is the one who will repeat what everybody else has said. The sheep is the one who will follow blindly what everyone else has said. The thinkers are those who say, hold on, now that the agenda has been set, let's go further and extrapolate the reality of this discussion. That's why there are two objections to the utopia. What are they? The two objections to there being a perfect state are that the first one is that while shaitan is present, sin is present. In which way? People say if the imam is going to establish this whole nation, this whole utopia, Shaitan's presence will never allow a human being to live in a world of justice. Because Shaitan has a role. He is the one who whispers in the breasts of mankind. He's the one who makes you think about sinning. He doesn't make you sin. He makes you think about sinning. Notice the difference. There are some who say Shaitan made us sin. In the Quran, he says on the day of judgment, don't blame me, blame yourselves. I invited you, you completed the act. You find that Satan's presence is obviously a hindrance to this theory. Why? Because how are you going to build a society of justice when Shaitan is whispering in one ear and Shaitan is whispering in the other? That's the first objection. A second objection is an internal objection. What is it? Many of you would probably have heard of a narration which states that the 12th Imam will be killed by a Jewish woman by the name of Saida from Banu Tamim. Some people say, well, if the 12th Imam is going to be killed, then that cannot be a utopia. Why? Because it shows that there is a human being within his state who has got the malice to want to kill him. And it's within our own books. So how can we say the world is a world of justice without any tyranny when there is a situation where the Imam himself will die? And of course, on that aspect of what happens after that, I have discussed it in another lecture of mine a few years ago on the topic of Raj'ah, if you want to refer to that. But suffice for us to say that there are objections. That when we keep telling everybody that this Imam, when he returns, the world will be full of justice and there will be no tyranny. Well, if there's no tyranny, then how's he going to get killed? I said, surely that means there must be some sort of tyranny still there. And what exactly is to be discussed here? This discussion is a contemporary discussion, not a historical one. Why? Number one, it's not a Shia discussion. It's a Muslim discussion. Because the belief in the Mahdi is a belief obligatory on every Muslim. Every Muslim in the world today, it's obligatory on them, according to their scholars, to believe in the Messiah that is the Mahdi. Yes, some believe he's born and others believe he's yet to be born. But you must believe in him.